It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is CEO Steve Mitzel. Steve has been Chief Executive Officer of MSPARC since September of 2015. He's led the company through six acquisitions in a two-year time span, spurring the company's top line growth 35% and bottom line 50%. Before that, he worked 14 years at Velasquez Communications in various executive level roles of increasing responsibility, culminating in General Manager, Senior Vice President of Shared Mail, a billion dollar plus division. He holds both an MBA and bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Michigan and bleeds maize and blue. Steve Metzel, welcome into the corner office. Thank you, Brent. Uh, it's great to have you here today. And uh, both of us are suffering through a, a cold pre-spring day here in Connecticut, but uh, with a lot of promise, I think, in the next few days, that it's going to get warmer. Uh, as I think I told you, you know, we move our family out a couple of times a year. And this is a little different than, than California. But uh, what can you say? We, we enjoy this part of the country. Now, tell me again where, where you grew up in. Where, did you come from the Northeast originally? No, I actually grew up in the Detroit area. Wow, oh, right, right. Cool. And tell me about those early years. Years, you know, uh, what was your early family life like? What did mom and dad do? Yeah, my dad was uh, an executive at Chrysler. Oh, cool! And so he had a, uh, you know, the whole tumultuous time when Iacocca was there. If we all remember oh, wow. that. And yeah. you know, at one point, he was actually threatened to be transferred to Mexico City. <laughs> so, which was interesting, right? And, and, and I think we bankrupt, and they acquired American Motors, and he had a chance to go work on an integration team, and. Had a really really nice career at uh, um, at Chrysler, and then my mom. My mom. So did you it. actually go to Mexico at, no, and live there for a while? Didn't. No, okay. We didn't. You talk <laughs> it was about more like, of a yeah, threat than anything yeah, else. Yeah, it was more of a threat. You think about how that could change your life, right? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And I think he realized that from from a parent perspective that he didn't sure. really want to go, but he also was balancing his career, and right, right, that came out on the good side of that. And then my mom was uh, stay at home. Okay. And uh, but she she did some jobs along the way. She she worked and. Um, she, you know, she was, she was great to have at home for me and my two brothers. So awesome. it was, uh, yeah, we grew up in suburban Detroit. Great. So three of you, youngest, oldest in the middle, where did you fall in the uh, pecking right order? Right in the middle with all the fun <laughs> stuff that comes with the middle child. Awesome. A couple of years apart or are there some gaps between you and your brothers? Yeah. My older brother is two years older and my younger is actually three, 361 days. So we're Irish twins. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Cool. It's so all very close and tight knit. That's great. And, uh, you know, what kind of a, uh, impact did they have or what kind of an influence? And let's start with your parents, you know, were they, uh, professionals in the sense, obviously your dad at Chrysler, you know, was there uh, motivations to go into the, you know, the, the automobile yeah. industry? Did, you know, mom have a degree? Tell me a little bit about them. Yeah, both my parents came from farm backgrounds. Oh, and cool. so my dad was actually from South Dakota and Catholic family from South Dakota, you know, the types of families where you had 10 kids and when wow. they were done, you had to go in the, the, the military, right? Because they just they couldn't afford to have them around. So of course, yeah. his entire family was uh, military. He was in the Air Force in Vietnam, um, probably before the conflict really, you know, went full on. Right. And then uh, he had that hardworking farm South Dakota background, right? Sure. And my mom had the same thing. She was from Northern Michigan. Her, her father was a farmer as well. So both had a very, very, uh, you know, great work ethic and solid stock. Solid, very yeah. solid, right? Yeah. And you, and you awesome. learned, you learned to. You know, you wake up in the morning and you worked hard from the morning to the end of the day. And, right. and it, but it was it was a fun environment. You know, my mom my mom did not have a degree until okay. 
we all finished up and then she went back to do some oh, really? billing. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. So you went yeah. back to get her bachelor's or and her she, master's? She got like an associate's, I believe. Uh-huh. And so she did medical billing. And when my dad retired, my mom started working. So it was kind of funny that way. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And what about your dad? Did he go to university? He did his, this is interesting because he did his school at uh, night school when we were growing up. Okay. So he it. did that cool. for 11 years and got his bachelor's degree. And uh, watching while my, at Chrysler, I presume. Yeah, yeah, yeah while at Chrysler. Yeah. And while I, I watched my dad do that, it's, I said it's something I would never do. And I ended up doing my MBA in the evening. So. <laughs> Times change. Yes. Was he kind of a 20, 30 year guy, Chrysler, long time uh, executive there? Yeah, 30 plus. Yeah. And then wow. when, uh, when Daimler brought him out, they, you know, they had a chance to, to retire early. So I think yeah. my dad was retired before he was 55. So, Got it. Got yeah. it. Nice, nice. And what would you say, you know, from your parents and or your brothers in the event that they might have had that impact too? What were some of the early, influences and, you know, things that you remember that, oh, wow, that was a good lesson learned. Yeah. It was interesting growing up with my brothers being so close because we're all in high school together. So we, we all pushed each other, whether we meant to or not, (laughs) you know, my two brothers were super smart. They were both full ride scholarships in college. Um, and, and the, you know, my older brother did his master's in undergrad in five years up at Michigan tech. Good for him. So we all kind of yeah. had that competitive nature to us, right? right? We right. pushed each other. My younger brother and I played soccer together. Hmm. So we were always in the same teams and we really enjoyed that. And then, you know, my parents, you know, they, they had that influence of, it was, you know, do the best that you can make hmm. sure you're getting your work done. Be really kind to people. Um, you know, a little bit of Midwestern value along the yeah. way and, and make sure you treat people with respect and, and just work hard. Nice. And that was the influence they really provided for us. Yeah. Any other early influencers? You, you'd mentioned, you know, soccer. Was there a coach or teachers that uh, had a particular impact on you? And if so, what 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 that influence might have been? Yeah. You know, we had a, a JV soccer coach that uh, really we were starting off and in, in, in grew up in Novi and we were we were really starting off as a, a soccer program and he yeah. really took to us and Early showed days. us, yeah, yeah, really showed us what we could, were potential of and, you know, led our team to this amazing record our, our sophomore year. And, uh, you know, he really had that influence of showing you what you could be if you tapped your potential. Hmm. Nice. That's cool. And uh, you'd mentioned your brothers were good students. What about you? I was a pretty good student. I was in the middle, you know. I my brothers, my brothers were awesome students. Both, uh, you know, one salutatorian, one valedictorian. I knew that wow. wasn't wasn't in my card, so I I took the little maybe the the middle route of having a little more fun than he did. But I, <laughs> you know, still graduated high school pretty pretty with a good GPA, and I and I got in the University of Michigan and did well there too. But I w- probably wasn't quite the same student they were. Yeah, yeah. What about outside of class? You mentioned soccer, or any other sports that you uh, liked or music, theater, other types of extracurricular things? Yeah, I, I, I could have played three sports. You know, I played baseball and football for a while. I got hurt in football all the hmm. time, so my mom didn't let me play that, um, but worked a lot. We all worked. So we had paper routes. Um, we were cutting lawns. We were scorekeeping. Mm, yeah, I was. Uh, I worked for the Detroit Pistons when they were did their back to back championships in their retail store. So, oh, that's awesome! When, when yeah. in high school or when did yeah, you do that? In high yeah. school, eighty nine wow. and ninety, and it was a great experience. I mean, cool. you know, you had to take a retail store that was averaging like two thousand dollars a day, and they do sixty thousand after they won the championships and. And they let us run the store. It was amazing. That's awesome. Cool. That's great. So it sounds like a lot of entrepreneurial things. When did you start with the paper out? Was that one of the first jobs you had? It was one of the first yeah. jobs. And and it, of course, like, you know, exactly that. We, we were in a growing suburb of Detroit and my brother and I both split the route. Then he handed it over to me and I automated the whole process of filling <laughs> and putting tubes up. And I always joke that my younger brother got to take it over when it was all set to go after I invested in the process and he just got to reap my hard work and my reward. That's interesting. So, so the older brother was the entrepreneur. You were the systems and process guy. And then the, the younger brother inherited the throne, right? Yeah, I think that's the way it works. <laughs> was it those types of paper routes where, you know, you, you literally earn it on tips? They don't subscribe to it or? No, it was, you... it was subscription. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, it was really neat because you would buy the papers and you had to collect the money. Oh, and yeah. We did yeah. really, really well. I mean, this is the late 80s, right? Newspapers were booming at the time. And right. we did really, really well with the route. 
That's awesome. Awesome. And what about um, during school and college? Were there jobs that you did as well? You mentioned the Detroit Pistons retail. What other types of things did you do to, you know, kind of help pay the bills or uh, support yourself during school? Yeah. You know, I didn't work when I was going to school. Summers was filled with working. We had no choice. And I uh, was a bank teller for two years. Oh, wow. Yeah, which was neat. You know, we like to be in the drive through so you can kind of turn customers on and off. Um, (laughs) But then uh, I eventually got an internship with Price Waterhouse, and that really set my whole career up after yeah. that point. Nice. And that was during your college years? Yes. And and how did you decide where to go for college? You know, it, going back to being a good student and, and just kind of wanting to have fun, I didn't think I was going to get into the University of Michigan. So mm. I, I thought about going to DePaul in Chicago. My dad took me out there. And it, you know, now, is you, DePaul private? Is that a private? It's university? private, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's downtown. So you basically had to commute from City Lincoln School. Park into yeah. downtown. And I looked at him and I said, I'm just, I know I'm not ready for this. Right. And then that kind of threw my whole college decision making in a loop. I didn't have a school. And I remember sitting there on Halloween and my mom didn't push me too much. And she just said, You got to fill your Michigan app out. Mm. And, and I did. And I got in. And so I had always loved Michigan from, from, you know, being born and raised there. And so yeah. when I got yeah. in, it was a no brainer. That's where I was going to go. Awesome. And how did you go about picking a major and deciding what to study? You know, I took an accounting class in high school and I really liked it. I liked numbers. Yeah. I would tell you that I, I was good at math, but I didn't like it. But accounting was different. And this is the 90s. So, you know, this is pre-internet boom. And there were the big six at that point. Sure. And, you know, provided a really good structure. And I just decided I wanted to be a CPA. I was good at it. And I did really great in my accounting classes. And um, it felt like a good place to start. Awesome. Yeah. And then you did the internship. Now, did you go uh, directly to, to Pricewaterhouse after school? Was that I, your first job out? I did. That was my yeah. first job. And I yeah. was, it was there for about three years. Kind of what standard, you know, accounting yeah. guys do, or were you more in the consulting side? I was in the audit side and right. I tromped around steel mills for two <laughs> or three years. Steel mills. Yeah. Wow. That was, it was fascinating to learn a process imagine. like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Did they give you leadership responsibilities early on, Steve? They did, you know, and that's one of the things I love. And I always tell the students that are, are thinking about going into, you know, working for an accounting firm is that you're going to get leadership experience early and you're going to get a broad yeah. array of clients that you're going to work on and understand different business models. But I think I was leading by two years in. So, I mean, being what, 24 years old and right. having uh, supervisor experience is, it was that's not a awesome. bad place to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, we do a lot of CFO searches. In fact, we're engaged in one now for a mid-market company on the East Coast, but we do two or three a year. And I always like to see that, you know, that first public accounting. And, and you know, regionals are great, too. You know, not they don't necessarily have to work for the big four now, I guess. Right. It was big six. I remember it was big eight. That's how long I've been around. Right. But, you know, it's just a really solid foundation. And what a great experience to see lots of different companies, too, at that early in age. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, those days were different. I dated That's myself, right. but you know, you'd show up with a suit and you'd have your shirt in your in your sleeve would actually have the <laughs> pencil let all over from dragging your hand from doing all the work papers. I and, love it. But yeah, it was it was a different day. And I remember getting computers and and I remember just doing different things. Like you know, I was talking about the steel mills. I actually developed a newsletter through all of Price Waterhouse where I started copying newsletter article across all of National Price Waterhouse wow. by copying it and putting it in your office uh, mail, you believe right. it or not. <laughs> right, sure. Right. Staple so, in the top. Yeah, so yeah. I became the steel industry expert within, oh, that's great. which was a really neat place to be, you know? So, yeah. um, but I think it's it's a little bit of seizing those opportunities when you see them and sharing them mm. with the world, right? Even if you had to do the work there much different than it is now, um, but Price Waterhouse afforded that to you. It was That's great. That's super cool. Yeah. Now, did you uh, only work in the steel mill business then for your three, four years there, or, or did they just start you there and kind of said, "Hey, this kid seems kind of kind of likes it. Let's keep him there." I mean, how did that kind of play out? You know, it was a it was my primary client. They were a public traded okay. client, and then right. of course you filled it in with other manufacturing because you were in Detroit. Um, there was big retail that we all we all kind of avoided to be on the Kmart account. Nobody really wanted to be there because right, um, right. it was just so complex. But um, I did some not for profit as well, and then I actually had some architectural and nice. services, and that's where I left Price Waterhouse to, to go be a controller for my client that was a. a ah international uh, architectural engineering firm. Yeah, very common path for many of the folks that started in uh, those audit positions. Right. Uh, let's go back to maybe some of those early leadership lessons. You said you were you know, supervising people at 23, 24. You know, what do we remember from back then, particularly maybe from bosses or mentors you know, that worked with you? And, and you know, if there were lessons of how not to you know, do certain things, that's just as valuable as others to our audience. 
Yeah, you know, and I think that's that's a really good point. I think the the lessons you learn, it was a young group of people at that mm. point, right? So the leadership development program that Price Waterhouse had even at that point was amazing. They would they would really institutionalize the the foundations of what to do. And I remember, in fact, the other day I saw uh, one of my my first bosses at post on Facebook about her leadership skills, and mm. I thanked her um, because she provided so much of the structure. And it was, yeah. you know, making sure that you're you're listening to your team, making sure that you're you know taking in consideration what they're doing, empowering, delegating, coaching when you're seeing they need to be coached, right. um, making sure the work because a lot of work where well, the work was going to get done and divvied sure. properly. You're putting the right people on the right task. I mean, all that sort of stuff was really kind of institutionalized and you learn that and you learn that from the really good people that you work with. Right. Um, but you also learned, I think, that there were how to respect people, right? And, mm-hmm. and that's one of the things that my dad taught me along the way was you make sure you you treat everybody with the same respect, whether at that so point true. it was yeah. the mail room versus the, you know, the partner. It's the same level of respect. And I think you could do that in that environment. And that was a huge foundational leadership, uh, you know, lesson. Great lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember the first time you started managing people? Yeah, it was scary. <laughs> yeah, talk to me a little bit about that. Was that, yeah. it was obviously a prize. Yeah, it was. And it yeah. was, um, yeah, I remember like you, all of a sudden you had this team and, you know, you thought you could do it and you're 23, 24 years old. Right. And, sure. and I remember thinking, you know, am I going to be good at what I'm doing? And, you know, am I going to have the right people and am I going to have enough people? And, and so you just evolve with you know, what works and you just kind of throw a lot of things out at the time about what right. may or may not work based upon your limited experience. Sure. Sure. Now, were they people your same age, a little younger, a little older? Just a little younger. Yeah, I mean, yeah. maybe some my same age because I, uh, I, you know, like there were people you could you could track up faster, and I was right, probably right. in that. Track, and plus, you so. did your internship as well, right. so you kind of had a leg up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, there was a little bit of the your peers, and and that was always hard too when you're managing somebody exactly your age or the oh, yeah. same level, and you you kind of advanced up, up, up just even a step. But um, yeah, that was it was interesting because you you have to establish yourself as the leader, but yet still be flexible enough to be able to work with them, right? Right. Do you remember when you started managing people that were older than you? Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was a challenge. That That's was a little first, scary too, isn't it? Yeah, that was my yeah. first job when I was at uh, at at the architecture company. I walked okay. into a group, and all of a sudden, I had people. You know, I was twenty five, twenty six years yeah, old, and it was right. a hundred hundred million dollar firm, and then they threw me into this, and I was like, "Here's your office, and <laughs> you got these people reporting to you, and they're all looking at you like." Who is this young kid yeah. that's going to tell us wow. what to do, right? Wow. And, and there and in that environment, there's no leadership development. You have to then take what you've learned and really start to work with people and understand where they're coming from and what their goals and objectives are and what their jobs are and you know, establishing credibility from the beginning. Sure, sure. What were some of the lessons from those early management experiences, Steve? Yeah, you know, um, I think the, the first lesson is just, just make sure that you – understand kind of where everybody's coming from, right? Mm-hmm. Especially being that young is just don't assume, don't walk in and just say, Hey, look, I'm the boss and this is going to happen, but really establish yourself as, you know, I'm here and I'm here to learn from you and I'm here for all of us to go. So really kind of, kind of establishing what the common goal is right? and then trying to, you know, you almost have to like interview everybody to find out what that common goal is sure. and then put it together. And I think the biggest lesson is communication. Hmm. Just communicating, right? Communicating why you're doing something, how you're doing it, and why it's important was huge. Yeah, yeah. Did you make any mistakes? Of course, right? I, you're going to ask me what they were. Um, <laughs> any that you yeah, want to share? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think there's there's that uh, element of, you know, you, you start to get the machine rolling and you start to get confidence. And sometimes at that age, you can get cocky, right? Right. And, and when you get cocky, you start to lose your credibility and then people not want to work for you. And I, I remember there was one person in particular as a controller at payroll responsibility, and she just was, you know, an emotional 19 year old kid Hmm. that just did not want to be there. I think it's trying instead of understanding why she was there, it was just a matter of just that, that, that sandpaper grit. Right. And you just, you wanted her gone at that point. Crack the whip. Right. You you just learn that like people aren't objects and, and you just, it's a hard lesson to learn, but you learn that like just not to be cocky and understand that there's way there's, there's good ways to deal with it. The Hmm. conflict. 
Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's very true. What would you say, kind of looking back at some of your previous bosses, what was the worst lesson that you've learned from a previous boss? And you don't have to mention any names. You know, that's cool. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, no. Yeah, that's a that's a great question because I think sometimes you learn more from people, yeah. some of the bad experiences. And I always tell people that, like, you know, it's, it's just there. I think it's respect. I think mm. when you're disrespected, you will check out faster than anything. Right. You just, you just don't want to be there. And that happened to you in the past. Yeah. It happened to yeah. me. I had, I had a year somewhere in the middle of my career right. where what's to say you get put in a little bit of a penalty box and you're just, you're stuck there and this right. person's going to make your life miserable. You, you don't want to treat people that ever, yeah. ever that way. And it was yeah. one of the hardest things to go through. You know, I, I learned a ton from that, but and it made me so much better because I didn't want to ever treat anybody that way. Yeah, right. It's really learning those things that you never want to do to someone else. Yeah, that's it's, right. Those last with you. Would you say that your um, leadership style has evolved over time? And if so, how? Yeah, I definitely think it has. Uh -huh. I think, you know, looking back now, and it's amazing how fast it goes by, right? You find yourself 20, 30 years into your career. I think now it's, it's, it's much more of a establishing trust, delegation collaboration, teaching, um, and the, the times have changed a lot too, right? So you right. have to evolve as a leader um, because you get people, different sorts of people working for you. But I think it's much more of a communicative and collaborative environment that I'm capable of doing mm. now than I was probably 15, 20 years ago. And I also think it depends on the the how your team is comprised, right? And, right. and, and what types of people you have working for you. And I think the big, one of the biggest lessons is making sure you treat everybody as an individual mm. and understanding that, you know, they have individual assets that they can bring to the table and how to leverage them. Right. Right. No, so true. Um, to take a little bit of a jog here, uh, you know, you obviously had an affinity for accounting in high school. You'd mentioned that. In fact, when we spoke on our planning call, you'd mentioned a particular teacher, I think, that kind of challenged you, right, if I recall correctly. And, you know, you kind of warmed to that. You decided to make those, you know, that that your area of study. You, you did the internship and, and, and now you're a CEO. So, you know, obviously you've, you've changed at some point in your career from being very discipline focused. It sounds like, you know, controller at the architecture firm, um, to where you are today. Give us a little bit of a, maybe not so much the chronological order, but the thinking behind going from kind of purely a controller on his way to become a CFO to, you know, taking your steps into the corner office. Yeah, it's a great question. I remember, and it probably happened before I took the controller job. I was at Price Waterhouse. And I had an opportunity to go work at General Motors. Mm. Coming back to a question you asked me earlier, my dad said, never work in the auto industry. <laughs> <laughs> so there was no modeling there. No, there was no modeling. <laughs> so then all of a sudden, I found myself going to work for General Motors. And I actually That's accepted the job. And I quit from Pricewaterhouse. Mm -hmm. Then I had this epiphany, like, I don't want to be the guy the rest of my career looking at FASBs. That's just not what I want to do. Yeah, right? And that's yeah. where I was going to get pigeonholed at General Motors. So right. I, went back to, I went back to Pricewaterhouse for about a year and I found a different path. But in that process, I started thinking about doing my MBA and pivoting mm. from accounting to finance and strategy. And so I knew I didn't want to be on the partner track. I knew I didn't want to be a pure accountant. I knew I wanted to have a more, and this is partly from working at Price Waterhouse, is I wanted to have more diversity in what I was offering. Right. And so right. going back to supplement my experiences in my first education and getting my MBA with something that I thought would parlay into the CFO role. And it and it really worked out well because eventually ended up at Velasis yeah. where you know I came in an accounting role and I always tell people you you stay strong in the core of what you do and you start to extend out. And so I was really good at what I could do in accounting. Then I started doing financial reporting. I started mm. working on you know special projects and debt refinancing. And all of a sudden people are looking at you like, hey, this guy's got more to offer than mm. just this. And you start to grow and, you know, you kind of become bigger in your role and then you grow strong in that core and you keep moving on. And, and when I had an opportunity to, to go be CFO, I was very young and we bought a company and it was a billion two, you know, division. that was shared mail. Yeah, think, it, was, right? it was, it was, yeah. it was a, we bought Advo and it was a, it was a shared mail. I mean, I was 34 years old and they said, Hey, we want you to go out to Connecticut and run this thing. And it was, mm. I was shocked. It was an awesome opportunity. Run it as right? CFO or, or, or as CFO. As C yeah, yeah. As CFO, um, right? And they spent a billion and a half dollars and they sent three of us out to Connecticut to go run this thing. And 
we did an amazing job. I mean, and, and it was such a great thing that, you know, two years later, they wanted to integrate all accounting and finance. They didn't mm-hmm. have a role for me. I set up, you know, I want to be general manager. And so I knew I knew the business well enough that they right. were like, hey, let's give Steve an opportunity to be general manager. So now I was completely out of finance. So right? you raise your aunt. Mm-hmm. Literally, let them I know did. that's what you wanted. I did. I yeah, absolutely did. I loved the CFO role, but I knew yeah. I was. I knew I could do more with this business. Right. And then I had a great CEO at the time, and he. I remember we would we would meet quite often. Great mentor as well. And he, I, I have to find it someplace. He wrote on a napkin. Here are the four or five things you need to do huh. to take your level. You know your your career to the next level. And I looked at. Do you them remember and, what those four or five things were? Yeah, it was product innovation. It was marketing. Yeah. It was sales. It was. Uh, and it was increased. discipline experience yeah. outside. Yeah, it definitely was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so then he helped me get there. That's and cool. And so I was there for a long time, and we did amazing things with that. Now, business. was he the Velasquez CEO? He at the was. Time? Yep. Okay, Got he it. was. So it was a pretty good career. Yeah, yeah, and I had a great CFO, uh, a mentor as well there. So I had I surrounded myself with really really strong leaders that took an interest in developing you, you right, know, and right. I think that's a key. It really is. And I, I spend a lot of time trying to find those same people in my organization and other organizations. I love to mentor because if somebody's yeah. got that passion and drive, who doesn't want to like get them to go to the next level. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so just to get you to the corner office you're in now, it looks like after Velasquez, you went and did your own consulting for a year or so. And then were you tapped by M spark or was it you recruited into the CEO slot? Tell me about uh, your transition to. Yeah. Your current so role. M spark was a partner company of Velasquez at the time okay. and they, they're, they're PE owned. And so they had gone through a transition and I, was consulting and they brought me in for a consulting gig and I called the PE firm up and said, you really should consider me for the CEO job. I think I can know what I can do here. Awesome. And, um, you know, raise your hand again, raise my hand it. again. And yeah. I asked for it. Yeah. And that's, that's what the, my team says. It makes me a natural salesperson. Although I don't think I am, but <laughs> I always, I do, I do say it like the worst anybody's ever going to tell you is no. Yeah, that's right. And so you have to ask for it. That's right. right. And if, if not, then if give you don't me the ask feedback, the answer right. is always no. <laughs> yeah, give me the feedback as to what it's going to take to get me there at that point. What, yeah. what skill set? What do I need to learn and grow and go do? That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about it, MSpark and, and what you guys do and, you know, give us a little background on the company. Yeah, MSpark is, uh, we're a PE owned firm. We're, we, we're a direct mail provider. We provide uh, cooperative direct mail to about 28 million households, mostly on a monthly basis. And uh, we cover 31 states. And so we have, you know, big, big clients and we have small little clients as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But our clients get a lot of value of what we do still in this day and age. Print does work really well. The mailbox responds. You wouldn't believe uh, some of the stats and and stuff that come out of how many, how much time people spend with their mail and what they do with it. Right. Right. Probably even more so now. It's almost almost a relief to get away from the electronic part of our lives. Yeah. I was on a call the other day with a client, a prospect, and they said, you know, we're actually going to go old school and we're going to go back into the mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. So we we are seeing a rotation back from some of the digital. And honestly, like print and digital work really well together. We just haven't invested in the digital side of the business because right. we're trying to get the print up and running and we've done tremendous in our growth. So Right, right. Now tell us a little bit about the organization, kind of, you know, relative size of employees, how you're structured. I know your PE firm, so you know you can't talk about sales or profits, but you know, give us kind of some relative size so we know the, you know, the kind of the scope of the business you're running today. Yeah, we have Approximately 800 employees. Okay. Now, four to 500 of those are part time in our production facilities. So, right. three, 350 are full time. So, you um, own your own print organizations and, and we, printing we process. outsource our print, but we bring it all together to okay. put the packages together. All right. We have, so, the like, kind of a fulfillment locations, right? right? Yeah, we have kind four fulfillment locations. And so, then we've got, you know, account services, we've got a big sales team, you know, all your primary IT, accounting, finance, marketing. Awesome. Um, and it's headquartered in Alabama. Got it. Got it. And uh, your your clients are, are large Fortune 1000 companies for the most part? Or are they um, middle market companies or across the board? Across the board. Yeah. You know, um, we're one of those pyramids where our largest clients account for 80 percent. And, you know, yeah, your, the bulk of your clients count for 20 percent because that's the way the pyramid works. But right, they're all over right. the place. Yeah. Great yeah. tenure. Great uh 
great tenure with our clients. They love what we do for them. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you're real passionate about it and enjoy what you're doing. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, building a company culture. Now, this company had been around for a while. Uh, as you said, it was a partner with Velasquez. You know, uh, when were they actually founded? How, how long have they been around? 30 years ago. Yeah. So it's, and, it, it's, and it's been a, a series of acquisitions, you know, right. in a sense, a roll up of, of, of companies. Kind of evolved over that yeah. period of time. Yeah. Right? It, you know, so do you have a specific company culture? If so, tell us a little bit about we it. We did. You know, when I started four years ago, I think it's one of those things where, again, one of those leadership lessons you learn. And I learned at Velasquez because we had amazing company culture. Mm. Velasquez was one of Fortune's top 100 to work for for many years. And I think they're still one of the, 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 in the Hall of Fame. So when you work for a company like that, you know what works really well, right? right? So when you step into this building and all of a sudden you're looking around and at the time, I mean, <laughs> anybody listening to this is going to agree with me. You know, there were, there were such misalignment. There was... Huh. Uh, silos everywhere. And, wow. you know, even consulting, I didn't quite see it. And all of a sudden, when you're in the corner office, you're like, this needs to be fixed. And this yeah. needs to be fixed right now. And so what you have to do is, you know, kind of put your footprint on what you want the culture mm. to be. But I always believe that you're not, as a CEO, you're not the only person responsible. Everybody in the company is responsible for sure. company culture, right? And you have to find those ambassadors that are going to work through. And so like one of the first things I did is I walked through the entire building and shook everybody's hand and just mm. let them know who I was, right? Yeah. Doors open, here's what we're here to do. And then we created so much more transparency and communication than mm. they ever had. You know, whether it's a monthly message, we have quarterly town halls, and then we went through and created core values. Here's our mm. core values, and we reward people on core values now. And so we transform the culture from silos to now core value oriented. The word that we we were on Birmingham's uh, business journal's best places to work two years in a row. Oh, that's great. <laughs> the word that people use is fun. Thank you. Yeah. They they use fun, but it's it's collaborative, right? Right. And so we spend a lot of time thinking and and really adopting our culture. And so. We have ambassadors across the whole company and we do great things with all these different events and we rally around a charity that I'm on the board of and it's 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 so much fun and and you know everybody gets along really well and I'd say one of the things that we talk about is not having jerks at work, right? So yes, yeah, so you're telling me about a little bit about culture and then no jerks at work. What does that look like? Yeah, no jerks at work. And we, you know, you're always gonna have conflict. Conflict's okay, productive conflict, but you don't want people that are gonna bulldoze people and, and just just lie and cheat to get their way. So one of our core values is integrity and we really stand right. and live by it. Right. And so we really just don't tolerate bad behavior at work. And if it's something happened, we'll call it out at any given level and upwards and sideways or, you know, That's awesome. any which way. Um, so it's, it's something we've, we've really invested in and in, in really making sure that we all are in sync. And I tell you, that's one of the hardest jobs about being the CEO is the consistent amount of time you have to spend on alignment, right? Yeah. Well, how many different locations do your 800 people uh, work at? We have the we have a headquarters, and then we have four um, production facilities, and then right. our sales force is most mostly remote. So we've got about 120 remote salespeople. Wow. So wow. it's yeah, it's a really interesting culture. A lot of right? moving it's a parts. A lot of yeah. moving parts. Yeah, yeah. What would you say is kind of the most unique or, or perhaps unusual uh, aspect about your company culture? I think the remote component of it. Yeah. And and I think there's a there's a component where people can feel like they're on an island, and so that's where the communication and the collaboration comes out to make sure that even as senior leaders, we're getting out to see people, right. and then we're also bringing them in. And I think just getting that unified company culture is has been the biggest challenge with the yeah. remote. What do you look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in, Steve? You know, I look for passion, hmm. drive, and a, one thing that I really love is intellectual curiosity. Hmm. I like I like to say I like two things from people when they want to peek around a corner and see what's there, and I also like when there's a gap and people step into it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's cool. necessary, right? Because right, sure. Well, we, and we, we just met as a senior team last week, and we were looking at our culture. We're like, the two things we need is people be more proactive, and we need them to really think about what they can do to drive, right? Because yeah. your company's not – it's run by the senior team, but it's really, really run and led by your tier two people. Right. 
right? In a way, that's kind of a reflection of your background, too. You know, you raised your hand for certain jobs that perhaps you would have been considered for had you not uh, volunteered for them. Right. Um, we had a CEO on, one of our um, women CEOs that, you know, like you, started in a couple of different, actually started in finance, moved to supply chain before she came to CEO. And I said, you know, you've got a kind of interesting career. You don't find people kind of changing out disciplines like that. She said, you know, if you, if you had to boil it down to one factor, and she said, it's simple. I volunteered for jobs that no Nobody else wanted to do, right. <laughs> you know, and and you respect those type of people, right? Particularly as a boss, when you know that, hey, this, you know, this isn't going to be fun. This is, you know, working with Kmart, right? Or you know, one of our one of our challenging clients. But you know, the people that kind of take that on enthusiastically, they they stand out. Yeah, and I was center midfield and in, in, in playing soccer, right? So you're the distributor. You're that <laughs> you're that person. I love when somebody wants the ball. Yeah, right? yeah. And, then, and and then if they even if they don't know what to do with the ball. Say, I want the ball, help me, right? And I think that's amazing. So I look for that in, in the people that we hire. That's I look awesome. for that in the people that we have. And, and if somebody, you know, it's not uncommon for me to work two or three levels down in the organization if right. I see that talent. Right. Do you uh, hire deep in the organization or do you deal mostly with the direct reports or get involved with maybe your direct reports hiring? Um, sometimes with my direct reports yeah. hiring, I think the nice part is we've established the culture and the type of people that we're looking for sure. that you de- typically don't need to get in there. We've, we've got a roadmap that works. Right. Um, but if somebody wants me to be involved, I'll be involved. Well, let's say if you only had about five minutes to maybe interview someone, it wasn't a key hire direct report to you. Maybe it was a, a subordinate's uh, uh, direct report or maybe even further down the line. But, you know, it was a new maybe division in the company or a new direction that you needed to go. But, you know, you just had five minutes. What, what would you focus on? What would you ask them about? You know, a couple of things. I think, you know, one question is, what are the two things that you're going to bring to this organization? Mm. Right. It's first day off the bat. What are you going to bring? Another one is, you know, what makes you go when you wake up in the morning? Mm. Like, what, what just what makes you tick? I'm always curious as to what makes people tick. And then I have a really strange question I'd ask people, and you're probably going to think I'm strange, but if I opened your fridge, what would it look like? <laughs> That's great. Are you looking for organization or are you looking for variety? <laughs> Both, right? Both, right? Because if you tell me your fridge is a hot mess, that means you're probably a hot mess, right? <laughs> It's, it's, it's an interesting thing too. If you're ever looking at a house, open up the fridge because like you're going to know yeah. how that house has been maintained. Yeah. And yeah. so it's just one of those weird questions that catches people by surprise. That's great. That's great. I love it. I love it. A couple of last questions. You've been very generous with your time, but I always like to ask, you know, if you had to decide, you, you know, uh, it's time to kind of micromanage someone, you know, w- when do you do that or when do you stay out of the sandbox? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question, right? Yeah. Especially when you get to be this level. You shouldn't have to do that. It right. does happen on, on occasion, right? And I think when it happens, is there some sort of breakdown along the way, but fundamentally mm. the person's not doing their job. Right. And so whether you call it micromanage or prioritize or whatever you need to do for them, if you've gotten to that point, they really need help or they're not understanding what the scope of their job is or how to sure. get it done. And so at that point, when you see, you know, and it's interesting as CEO, you got all kinds of different levers to pull, whether they're operations or sales. When you start to have to do that, that's like the the big warning bell going off that you've got a problem. And you typically know it's happening before. So you're you're leading up to that point. And then right. you can't do that forever because it's not sustainable, right? Because if you have to start to do somebody else's job, it's it's not gonna work. Right, right. First warning signs. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Well, Steve Mitzel, CEO M Spark, it's been terrific talking to you. We always have one last question we always ask at the end of the podcast. And, you know, we've got a lot of different people listening to this. We've got perhaps some of your peers that are in the C-suite and looking at the corner office themselves. Uh, we certainly would have folks that have been, you know, founding their own companies or maybe thinking about that somewhere down the line. And others like you who might have said, you know what, I've been 10 years in accounting, but I think I could be a general manager. And, you know, someday I maybe even could become a CEO. CEO, what, what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone who, you know, kind of has their eyes on their own corner office? It's a great question. I would say if you really, really want it, part of what we were talking about was ask for it, right? right but have right. the drive. Surround yourself with smart people that are driven and passionate. You can't teach drive and passion. No. And so if you have those things, you can learn just about any single business. You can learn what to do and what not to do. You can dive into leadership, but get the leadership experience. Want, you know, know what you want to do, whether the path is not a straight path, it could be zigzag, that's okay. 
know where you want to be, let it evolve, but have the passion and drive. If you do those things, then you can get there. Amen. (laughs) Great stuff, Steve. Well, once again, thank you so much for sharing your journey into the corner office. Thank you, Brent. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.